In this lecture, I want to give you a better understanding of the hardware that you need to complete this course and to be able to follow along with all of the experiments that I'll be doing. So uh, hopefully by the end of this video, everything that you see here will make more sense. I thought I would have everything on my bench just so you can see the entire set of items uh, that you'll need. Some of the things that you see here are really really needed some others are optional so let's begin from the most important part of the tools that you're going to need and that is the breadboard i've got a bunch of different size and types of breadboards they're all compatible with each other meaning that the the spacing between the holes that you see here are all the same uh, i'm not going to go through the details of course i've got a dedicated lecture to where I explain how to use a breadboard. But here, I just want to show you a few options. So here's a large breadboard. Uh, you'll be able to do everything you need with something of this size, and they either have connectors for power and ground. But this is kind of an overkill because we are only going to be building small circuits. So you can easily use something like this that is very popular in kits. In particular, I tend to use kits from Sun Founder, and pretty much all of the kits contain one of those elongated breadboards. You can see that the uh, relative size, this is double the size of one of these. You can also go down to a mini breadboard like this, which as you can see, is just half of this one here. And even smaller can go down to a quarter essentially. Uh, something like that. I'd stay away from these because for most of the things that we'll do, these are too small and they also lack the, the, the two rows, top and bottom, where you can plug in power. So I, I tend to like this size breadboard for uh, most of the work that I do, especially in this course. So final tip, recommendation, either go for one of these or for one of these. All right, so that's the breadboard. Next up, We've got the jumper wires. So uh, in order to create the circuits on the breadboard, we'll need to connect the components with jumper wires. So there are two general types of jumper wires, those with flexible cores and those with solid cores that tend to be a little bit more rigid. I like to use both types of jumper wires in my circuits. I tend to use the ones with a solid core, so you can see they come in different sizes, in order to interconnect components on the breadboard itself. And then I use the longer flexible jumper wires to interconnect the board with external power supplies or with battery power supplies, or if I want to have circuits that, that span more than one breadboard, then I can also use the flexible core jumper wires. So, uh, yep, I recommend that you get both and uh, you will definitely make a lot of use of those jumper wires throughout this course and other courses that you're most likely going to take in the future. So that's jumper wires. Another thing here is a lab book. I definitely recommend that you get a booklet like this, a notebook for your lab specifically. Um, I'm going to be using this one here throughout the course and you can see what my notes look like. So as I'm going through an experiment, I take notes, I write down values, I document what I'm doing and I document my plan as well, my circuits, the values for the various resistors in this case or other components in the circuit, all my calculations, the results of my measurements, all these things go in a lab notebook. I recommend you start with one as well. Nothing really beats, in my opinion, pen and paper to have handy in the lab to take notes. So let's see notebook. Next up, we've got power supplies. So most of the experiments in this course, you will only need one power supply there are a few examples or a few experiments where you need two power supplies. So what I do recommend is to consider the simplest option. Now, these are options that I'm giving you and you can choose which ones you want to go for. I do recommend that as the simplest possible option is to have uh, batteries, just to use batteries. So here's a nine volt battery, for example, uh, that can be used with some of the experiments. All you need is to have a clip like this plug it on, and then from here you can go to the breadboard. Now because the 
circuits that we are building will be going on a breadboard, you want to have a clip for your battery that ends up in just exposed wire like this. And then these wires can be inserted into the power rails of the breadboard. So that's an easy option, a nine volt battery with a clip like this that plugs into the breadboard. Here's another example of such a power supply. This one uses AA batteries. And the nice thing about this particular option is that it's got an on off switch. So you switch it off when you're not using it so that there is no risk of wires touching each other and causing a short circuit. And in addition to that, you can see that the wires coming out of this battery box are exposed. So you can plug them onto the breadboard. So that's another option. Here's another example of such a power supply. This one ends up in a battle connector. So you're gonna need some additional adapter to connect this to your breadboard. But that is an option as well. Another option that I want to show you is a wall power supply, something like this, or even a USB power supply like this one here. The nice thing about the USB power supply is that I'm sure you've got several of those lying around and then you can combine them with something like this, which is a breadboard power supply. You can see that on one side, there's a USB input for power and also a battle connector. So you could use, for example, this power supply with the battle connector, plug it in here. And then this power supply has got special circuitry on it to output two different voltages, a 3.3 volt on one side if you want and a five volt on the other side. You can then plug it onto your breadboard and very conveniently, you can turn it on. It's got an on off switch. You can have one voltage on one side and another voltage on the other side for those experiments that require two different voltages. There's jumper wires here that allow you to choose what voltage goes on either side. So you'll be able to use uh, this power supply with any kind of battery or world power supply that provides at least five volts out. And also it's worth mentioning this device here. It's also a world power supply, but the nice thing about it is that it's got a selector for the voltage and you can use a screwdriver or in my case, a tweezers to select the voltage that you want. So this one goes from five volts all the way to 12 volts. We just need a couple of types. So this is also an option. The high end option in a way is to have bench power supplies. So here I've got two of those and those allow me to essentially calibrate the power supply for my circuit to the exact voltage and maximum amperage that I want to be coming out of that. And since I have two power supplies here, I can power a circuit that requires two different voltages for the experiment. So this is something you can consider for the future. I recommend that you start with batteries because it is a safe option. Then you can also consider a world power supply like this, which is configurable. Or if you have five volt USB power supplies like this one, you can use those as well. I think a really nice piece of equipment to have handy is this breadboard friendly power supply because of the options that it gives you for the input both USB and battle connector. Okay, so that's it with power supplies. Let's move on. Still talking about tools in the hardware lecture. I wanted to show you a multimeter. I highly recommend that you have a multimeter in your kit. If there's only one bench instrument that you have for this course, that should be the multimeter. So the one that I'm showing you here is an auto ranging multimeter. I've got a dedicated lecture about multimeters, so I'm not going to give you any other options, but I just want to mention here that a multimeter is the instrument that you'll be using the most in this course to make measurements. You'll be using this multimeter to measure voltage, resistance, current, capacitance. All you really need really is a simple multimeter. It doesn't even need to be auto ranging, but you need to have at least one multimeter. In my case, uh, as I said, I've got a dedicated lecture on multimeters. I'm going to show you a few options. But aside from this uh, multimeter, I also have a benchtop multimeter right here, which I sometimes use. I won't be using this much in this course. I'll be going with my portable 
multimeter just to keep things simple. In terms of other bench instruments, I've already spoken about the power supplies. I am also going to be using a oscilloscope. This is not required for you to have in this course. It's also a fairly expensive instrument, but I will be using the oscilloscope to show you a few interesting topics uh, when we go into the AC electricity and electric circuits section of this course and also when we charge capacitors and inductors. This is a fairly expensive piece of equipment compared to the cost of everything else that you see here. And it's not, as I said, it's not necessary for you to have one of those. But if you do want to get the experience of using a oscilloscope without the expense, you can go for something like this. This is a pocket oscilloscope from Zulark. Really nice piece of equipment. It can basically do everything that you need to do in the context of this course. It will show you how a capacitor is charging, how an inductor is charging. It will show you highs and lows of uh, voltages in various circuits. So it can actually do everything that we need to do. And it's got some other features as well that do some of the work that this device here does. This is a function generator that I will also be using in this course that you don't really need to have. These are lectures in which I teach you several topics in AC or signal analysis topics. And um, yeah, the Zulak can also do some of the work that the function generator on my bench top can do. So it's a three in one instrument. It can also play the role of a multimeter as well. So it's a very interesting and versatile instrument to have in your kit. And um, if you are again interested in learning the functionality of a oscilloscope, a function generator, and uh, a more sophisticated multimeter, you can consider the Zulak here. It's a really nice option. All right, so that's it with the uh, oscilloscope, and I also mentioned the function generator. So let's move on. The last uh, piece of equipment that I recommend that you have before you start is this, <laughs> the tweezers. Going to have a lot of tiny components that we work with. This is a ceramic capacitor, so having tweezers will make it much easier to manipulate those items and place them on the breadboard and then pick them out of the breadboard to reset for another experiment. So have a set of tweezers like this, ideally anti-static, so that they don't hold any charge. And um, some really nice tweezers can also tend to be magnetic. That's kind of a um, personal issue. Sometimes you want things to stick on the tweezers, sometimes you don't. So I prefer non-magnetic tweezers just so that they don't interfere with uh, the various items that I'm picking from my boxes. So for example, here I've got a box of stuff. I just throw things in here that I don't need and I might need a little later and I can use my tweezers to easily pick an item from the bottom of this box. If this was magnetic, it would probably pick up a bunch of other things that I didn't want to. So yep. That's just a, a personal choice. Here's the one that I use. Okay, moving on. Just going to clean up a little bit now. Uh, I want to go to the components that you'll need. The components that you will need uh, are not that many. You're going to need a bunch of resistors. So assorted resistors with various values, uh, something like this. So whatever you need something, just pick it out of this bag. One piece of advice is to look for a pack of resistors where the values of the resistors are nicely marked on the package. It's just going to make it much easier to find what you need. We're going to be using resistors from this bag, either individually or sometimes we'll just uh, bundle them together in order to achieve a value of resistance that is needed for the various experiments. So that's why it's important to be able to pick resistors easily and then combine them if necessary. So there's a bunch of resistors. You're also going to need capacitors and capacitors come into different types. So you're going to need a, a few assorted ceramic capacitors and electrolytic capacitors. We'll be using these especially in the RC circuits. So for the electrolytic capacitors, you can have values such as uh, 47 microfarads. The exact values for the ceramic capacitors are not that important, but typically they come in an assorted set of values. So you can pick the ones that you need. And just like with the resistors, you can see here that in one experiment, I had to bundle a bunch of capacitors together in order to get the 
close at least to the value that I wanted for one of the experiments. So this is why you need to have a variety of values of both resistors and capacitors. You're also going to need inductors. So here's a bag of inductors. So inductors are like the coils. We'll have some experiments with coils and you can see just like with the capacitors and the resistors, the values of these inductors are marked on the package. So it's easy to find what they are. This is even more important than capacitors and the resistors because it's not easy to figure out and experimentally measure the value of any inductor. You need to have a special instrument to do that, which I don't here. So I do rely on the written values on the package to help me figure out what a particular inductor is. And uh, just to be careful as well, so you can see a inductor is kind of similar in shape to a resistor. All right, so they look similar. Inductors tend to be green and much larger in diameter than a resistor. But just so that you know, these two do look similar and can confuse people. <laughs> okay, moving on, you're gonna need some LEDs. We have a couple of experiments where at the very beginning of the course where uh, you learn how to assemble a circuit with an LED. And uh, LEDs come in a few sizes. I like these ones for experiments with not too many parts because these LEDs are very easy to manipulate. And of course, they're very bright, very nice. So these are five millimeter LEDs and these are half size, two and a half millimeters. So there's LEDs. You're also gonna need a push button like this. So you can remove the cap, expose the, the mechanism here and these, components are all breadboard friendly. So it means that the pins that they come with match the geometry of the holes in the breadboard. So whatever you get, make sure that it is breadboard friendly and you can put the cap on. So there's a button. We use buttons to charge or to help charge and discharge capacitors. You're also gonna need a 10 kilo ohm potentiometer. So potentiometers are devices that are basically resistors that are variable. So you can turn the knob and the resistance of this particular device changes. And as you can see, it's also breadboard friendly, so I can attach it on my breadboard without having to stress the, the pins of the device because the geometry of the pins fits with the geometry of the breadboard. Okay, and that's it with this lecture. So this is just a quick overview of the various bits and pieces that you'll need, tools and components in order to follow along with all of the experiments in this course.